Hi, my name is John Cullen. I'm one of the pastors here at Southbridge. Thank you so much for checking out our sermons online. Our prayer is that you're challenged by the Word of God and grow in your affections for Christ. We recognize that this can be a great supplement to your personal study, or maybe you simply could not make it to church this week. Our hope, though, is that you're plugged into a local community of faith. So if you live in the Raleigh-Durham area and are looking for a church, we would love to meet you on a Sunday and help you get connected. If you are not local, we want to encourage you to find a gospel-centered church in your area. Thank you again for letting us be a part of your week. Enjoy the Word of God proclaimed. There are things that begin to happen in culture that uh, the song just begins to resonate, right? It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. and um, It begins to look a lot, a lot like Christmas when certain things happen, and for different people it's different things. Um, it, it's looking like Christmas earlier and earlier these days because stores are putting out Christmas stuff like at Memorial Day. And so they're going to put stuff away, and right after Easter, they'll start breaking it out again. But um, I love that old song, right? It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas, and, and nothing more than Christmas lights. Um, we were visiting with some neighbors yesterday, and one of our neighbors is like, you know, I saw more lights out earlier this year, and it just kind of felt more Christmassy. And I love Christmas lights, don't you? Yeah. Um, you know, I always, I love Griswold Christmas and, you know, Dad, you taught me everything I know about exterior illumination and, you know, they're just those great moments. One of our kids, our oldest son, loved doing Christmas lights with me, but he had a couple of rules. It had to be cold and he had to be able to get on the roof. And so we, we, we spent many hours on the roof just honestly sitting around, hanging out, just having a good time. And, and uh, but that, that was always fun. And Christmas lights are just part of Christmas. And there's cool history I was reading up on a little bit and, you know, kind of how they started burning candles on trees. And it was really the intent of showing some of the ornamental features a little bit more. And then that kind of took over in early 1900s and all that kind of stuff. I'm not going to get into all that. That's not why we're here. But I love Christmas. I love Christmas lights. So Merry Christmas. Um, I hope that you've already planned uh, to join us for one of our four services on, on Christmas Eve. And uh, we just ask you to, you know, reserve a spot help us kind of plan accordingly. So hit sfchurch.com and you can do that and, and we would greatly appreciate that. Um, we think about Christmas, we think about this series. I've loved what Pastor Scott has done with this series so far, just pressing into the reality that, that Jesus is the light of the world, that he came to illuminate the darkness, that he came to invade and step into that place of emptiness and sin and bring hope. And that's what Christmas is. Uh, my fear is that in many ways we've distorted the idea of Christmas. Um, and, and I want to be a little bit cautious as a, as a parent with empty nester, kids gone. Some of you still have kids at home. Um, so I will be a little bit delicate, but we have to be really careful in how we balance the narrative of Jesus at Christmas time with all the other things that our culture screams at us with Santa Claus and Elf on the Shelf and you know, all these other things that are taking place. And, and it's so easy to, to distort what Christmas is. And as a parent, as you disciple your child, it's, it's your responsibility to navigate them to know and love Jesus more. And Les and I wrestled with that as, as younger parents. And, you know, how do we reconcile the difficulty of a story of a man named Jesus with our children, with all the other difficult stories that are out there to believe? And at what point do my children go, well, if, you know, what's, what's true and uh, what do I know? So uh, we want to love you. We want to nurture you in that process. But as Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ, we celebrate the fact that Jesus is the light of the world. Uh, that's what Christmas is. And so press into that this year. I, I love that Pastor Brad, if you're on Facebook, uh, some of the social media, he shared um, just some various sites around town that you could go visit Christmas lights. I encourage you to do that with your children. Use that as a teachable moment to talk about Jesus who came and stepped into a dark place and that he brings light and he brings life. And so uh, that's available. Reach out to the, the family ministry office if you don't have that. We'd love to get that to you. And just get out and spend some time as a family. Uh, but if you follow along on our small group study guide and the sermon outline, you will see that I've already mentioned our first point this morning, and that is simply that Jesus is the light of the world. We're going to continue the Illuminate series this morning by looking at John chapter 9. And let me just summarize that because we're not going to take time to read all of that, but we're going to hit various parts of it this morning. Jesus, amidst his public ministry, encounters a man who was born blind. And his disciples immediately say, well, whose fault was that? 
Because the culture of the time, it would have been proper for the disciples to have that understanding that, well, either his parents sinned or he sinned. And, and so there, there's a lot of theology there that we won't press into this morning, but who sinned? And Jesus said, none, just simply so that the glory of God can be revealed. And, and when I think about the Illuminate series, I can't think of a greater story to kind of give us a picture of exactly what's taken place when Jesus comes to the world than to deal with a man who knows no light whatsoever. He, he was born in darkness. He was, he was born in, in blackness. He has no picture in his mind of, of color, of light at all. And so to demonstrate who Jesus is, he steps into this man's life and he gives him sight. He illuminates for him the glory of God through his healing power and also to those around him. So to, to set up John chapter 9, let me just read some verses that John has already shared in his, in his writings, beginning in John chapter 1. Pastor Scott hit on this in the series a little bit, but let's just remember where John has taken us so far. John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing, uh, not anything is made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. You see the theme that John's moving into here? Verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He's referring to John the Baptist. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. So verse 9, the true light which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. So now he's beginning to refer to Jesus, who was in the beginning, before the world created, he existed. So in the, in the darkness, he was still light when the earth was created and formless and was void. There he still was. And now he's going to come into the world. So then we move through in John chapter 3. We're all familiar probably with John 3.16. But understand John 3.16 in its context as we read a little bit further. He says, for God so loved the world that he gave. The gift of Christmas, right? That he gave. God gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. We're going to see that in John chapter 9. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works be exposed. And so as he moves forward in his, in his ministry, he moves into John chapter 8. He, he sees the woman caught in the act of adultery and being stoned. And, and he's now interceding because Jesus always went to the, to the fringe places of culture. He, he went there, and, and so he steps in, and right on the heels of that, John chapter 8, verse 12, again, Jesus spoke to them, being his followers, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And then he goes on the remainder of chapter 8, just kind of speaking to uh, his credibility as the Messiah, the one who said, before Abraham was, I am. And so right on the heels of Jesus doing all of that and establishing that credibility, we encounter him in John chapter 9, having this encounter with this man who was born blind. What we know about light, I often see clearly demonstrated in the ministry and the life of Jesus. And when I read through John chapter 9, thinking about this morning, uh, I saw four things about light that I want to share with us this morning that I see in the text. The first thing I want you to see is that light invades darkness. It's amazing if you are in a dark, dark place, how a little bit of light makes all the difference in the world. Because that light just begins to invade that darkness. And the ministry of Jesus was out among the people. Jesus went to those fringe areas. He invaded dark and hurting places to deal with hurting and outcast people. The common phrase of the Pharisees at this time would be to simply praise God I'm not a Gentile, praise God I'm not a woman, praise God I'm not a child. So it's interesting, where was Jesus' ministry? He stepped into those dark, broken, fringe areas and he began to minister to the outcast. Why? Because light invades darkness. Jesus stepped into those dark, difficult areas 
to deal with the hurt of these people. So in John chapter 9, verse 1, as we begin to pick up, it says, as he, that's Jesus, as he passed by, where was he? He was out amidst the people. He was invading the dark places of culture. He encounters a man, he says, he saw a man blind from birth. Now you have to understand, this guy was an outcast. This guy's already been ostracized from the temple. He has no place there. Uh, the, the Pharisees don't care for him because he's, he's a sinner. He's blind, so obviously he's not right with God because he has some level of ailment. So he's already been ostracized and kicked out of the temple as his family, you're going to see in the text, is sort of that they're afraid that they're going to get kicked out. And so there's no love, there's no grace for these people. And, and so Jesus is somewhere out where others are not going to find him. But as people are drawn to him, they're, they're following him. And so it says, he saw a man blind from birth and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Again, common question of the day. That would have been their understanding. Verse three, Jesus answered. Circle Jesus, if you have your Bible open. Circle Jesus answered. It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. And then verse five, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Hang on to that phrase. Jesus is the light of the world. We're actually introduced since it's Christmas time. I think it's important to bring in the, the nativity story. So if you would uh, sometime this week, just read the nativity story as a family, go back to Luke chapter two and read that encounter. We often quit before we see some of this ministry of Jesus actually introduced. Because in Luke chapter two, if we went back, I'm gonna actually pick up in verse 25 where most of us kind of had already stopped. But it says, now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ, that is, Messiah. So this was a man who deeply loved God. The Word of God says that he was uh, revealed to this truth by the Holy Spirit of God. And, and he had now seen right? He's being introduced to the Lord Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the promised one, the one that had 300 plus prophecies in the Old Testament about this coming Messiah. Simeon is saying in, in verse 27, he came in the spirit to the temple. And when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him, according to the custom of the law, we're going to talk about that. He took up uh, took him up in his arms and he blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. In other words, now uh, my life is complete. He, he had been promised by God that he would not die until he saw the Messiah. And so here he is holding this, this child in his arms and he blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word for my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. Verse 32, a light, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to the people of Israel. Simeon, as he held this baby. Now, what we have to understand this is a baby. This is still the infant Jesus. Because as it says, according to the custom of the law, as it was in Jewish tradition, at about eight days, they would bring a newborn baby to the temple and they would give that child a name. And according to the instruction of the angels to Joseph and Mary, they named the baby. Come on, say it out loud like you believe it. They named him Jesus. So they brought this infant child to the temple and they, they named him. And, and then the custom and the tradition, again, in Jewish culture is when a woman would give birth, there was a 40-day purification cleansing process. And then at the end of 40 days, she would come to the temple and, and give the Lord an offering. So probably about six weeks old. So here's this infant Jesus being introduced to this ministry of light to do what? As revelation to the Gentiles. Hope, purpose, life, eternal, coming to the Gentiles as well as glory, right? This glory of the Messiah being revealed to the nation of Israel. So this is, this is the ministry of Jesus. I am the light of the world from my very birth, from pre-birth, when, when the angels appeared in the glory and splendor of night, 
with, with, the, with the light shining. It's, this is the ministry of Jesus. Jesus is the light of the world. That's what we celebrate. So not only does d- light invade darkness, but also light attracts things. You ever notice that? Any people just love to sit outside, turn on a light, and sit around with all the bugs that start to attract? Any, anybody? That's just your thrill, man. It's like, ah, I love doing that. I want to come hang out with you, because you probably have one of those, like, gun zappers or that, that electric racket or something that you just love, like, zapping these things. I don't know. But I, I've discovered that light attracts things, and not all those things are pleasant. Am I right? I mean, not all those things are pleasant. Sounds like ministry in the local church, right? The light of Jesus draws people to himself, but all those people are not people that we get along with. Amen? Somebody say amen. Look at your neighbor and go, yeah, I think he's talking about you, right? I mean, but that's what the light of Jesus does. It attracts all sorts of things. Jesus said, hey, just go catch fish. You're not going for a certain species. You're not just looking for the walleye or the, the smallmouth or the big mouth bass or you're not, you know. No, just catch every, everything. Just go catch fish because the light is going to begin to draw them. It's going to attract them. And so I think about this man born blind who, who Jesus now begins to invade his space. He begins to invade the darkness and he attracts because what does he do? He, he begins to address this man. And I think about this, and I think about the great pastor, preacher, author, A.W. Tozer, in his classic work, The Knowledge of the Holy, when he said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And I think in this moment, that could be absolutely true with the question that's being asked. His, His name is Jesus. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. So if we say the same thing about our answer to this question, who is Jesus? Well, when you think about celebrating Christmas this year and you think about celebrating the birth of Jesus, who is the light of the world, can I just ask you a question? Who is Jesus? What what comes to your mind when you think of Jesus? That will affect how you celebrate this week. John chapter 9, verse 5, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. I love Pastor Scott's message from last week, and at one point he, he mentioned Jesus as he's teaching from Matthew chapter 5, and he said there's three types of people around him right now, which I think is true probably every time that Jesus is interacting, except in those small, intimate moments with some of the disciples but typically in a public setting, and I could certainly see it here as he simply passes by and he has people drawn to him. And Pastor Scott said there's there's typically three types of people in the crowd, which I could certainly see here as well. The committed. His disciples are with him. These are the guys that know the light is coming to the darkness and that Jesus is the light and they've trusted him. Would you agree they're there? Okay. The second type, he said, are the curious. Those that, that, man, they want more than this dark world offers, but they aren't sure if Jesus is the answer. Could you see those people being there? This guy's doing some pretty phenomenal stuff. He's healing people. He just rescued this woman in John chapter 8. It's like, who is this guy? They're curious. So people are following him because they're curious. Uh, There's also the conflicted. He talked about the conflicted. They live in darkness and they're blinded by darkness. They're opposed to or they're in conflict with their creator. Could you see those people being there? Yeah, we're going to get introduced to some of them in the story. Because they're conflicted. They're they're so blinded by the darkness and, and in contrast to the light that they don't know what to do. Every one of us this morning are in one of those three camps. And it's okay. It's okay to just be honest with God and say, God, here's where I am. Man, I'm, conf- I'm, I'm committed. I'm curious. Some of you are just curious. We're moving into Christmas. There are certain traditions that you begin to associate church, and it's like, man, maybe I should do that. And you're just curious. We're glad you're here. If you're watching with us online, we're glad you're here, and we're trusting that God is going to speak to your heart. Some of you are conflicted. Because even being in this place, you're sitting here with a certain sense of bitterness and angst and frustration. Maybe like the couple I talked to years ago who came and said, hey, Pastor Dave, I'm just, you know, we tried this Jesus thing and it's just not working for us. I'm like, really? So you, tr- you tried this Jesus thing? <laughs> they were conflicted. They were very conflicted because they were so blinded by the darkness. 
So, so we say, who is Jesus? As, as one of these three people, if you identify, you have to answer this question, who is Jesus? I mean, in that moment, who is Jesus? I, I love uh, Pastor Alistair Begg. I love his writing. I love his preaching. He says, who is Jesus? He is God, the Son, born as a man. That's what we celebrate at Christmas, amen? He is God. He's born as a man. He is the perfect law keeper who died to free those who had not kept the law. That's me, by the way. What is a Christian then? It is someone who has been freed from the penalty of sin and adopted into the family of God. That's also me. That is a message we should preach to ourselves daily and we should pray for an opportunity to share with someone else daily. Man, what a great truth. Who is this Jesus? As we think about celebrating Christmas, who is this Jesus? So he invades the darkness, uh, light attracts things, but also light causes growth. Light causes growth. Uh, I'm the guy, as a single guy, living in an apartment by myself, I literally killed a silk fern. So I, I'm, not, I'm not the guy to like house sit your plants or anything else. Dogs, I'm okay. Cats, mm, they're questionable. I'm a little conflicted on the cat thing. But um, yeah, plants, we just don't, we don't do well. Um, we have some ladies in our office when Debbie was there and Michelle. I mean, they're like really gifted with this stuff, but you don't want to leave them with me. Um, but we understand that, you know, sometimes they're moving stuff around the office. Well, this needs more light or this, you know, I, I don't understand that stuff, but I do understand that light causes things to grow. So as people are exposed to the light of God's truth and grace, they are drawn to him and, and they're drawn into his presence. And we see that with this, with this guy. This is a biblical principle that, that we see, even going back to Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18, it says, but the path of the righteous. In other words, there's, there's a drawing process. We're moving along a path. The path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. In other words, the more you walk in the path of righteousness, the more you are growing in a walk in relationship with Jesus Christ, this light is growing and growing, and it continues to grow until full day or completion. And the implication here is that none of us arrive until we arrive in the presence of God. There's not one of us that will ever stop a spiritual growth process because none of us are ever going to learn all that we need to know about how much God loves us and cares for us and what his plan is for us until we're done with this life and we're standing in his presence. So there's a growth process. There's a progression, if you would, of spiritual growth, of understanding, of taking the things that I learned from God's word and beginning to apply those things to my life. And, and we're, we're constantly wrestling with that because we're all broken. And God's gonna speak to our heart at different ways, in different situations, at different times, and he's gonna teach us very uniquely. So 2 Corinthians chapter 4, as Paul is writing, he says, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So there's this continued theme that if we're going to grow in the knowledge and the wisdom and the love of God, we have to abide in his light. We have to be progressing as we grow in relationship with him. So I want you to see what, what happens in John chapter 9 in this blind man's life that I believe shows this progression. And when you think about those three types of people, right, that, that uh, conflicted person, that curious person, to that committed person, I want you to see it because I, I see it in the text right here. John chapter 9, verse 11, this man is conflicted, this blind man. Jesus basically approaches him, he spits, he makes some mud, he puts it on his eyes. Theologians have wrestled with this. Here's the honest answer that we know as to why Jesus did that. We don't know. He wanted to do it, so we go, cool, do that. Uh, we see in Mark where he, he's healing a, a, a deaf mute and he sticks his fingers in his ears. Why did he do that? I don't know. I mean, if he, if he raised someone from the dead or healed someone without even being there, uh, there, there was no sense of, of the physical touch. It says that he spit and made the man mute. Now, I don't know if he spit on his fingers and touched his tongue, but it said he touched his tongue. So I don't know if he spit on his tongue or if he spit on his fingers or if he did. I don't know. I don't know what he did, but he's Jesus, so he can do what he wants to do. So in this moment, why he did that, I don't know. But I find it interesting that he, he did that and he put this mud on a man's eyes. Then he told him to go to the pool of Siloam, which actually means scent. So hang on to that thought. 
and told him to just wash. So maybe he had to give him a reason to go wash. I don't know. But there's nothing clear in Scripture that tells us why, but that was Jesus' methodology. And so as he healed him, the Pharisees now, all of a sudden, these righteous guys, or they think they're righteous, they call themselves conservative. I call them preservative, right? Um, Because conservative, we, we go with what God is doing. We're trusting the Lord. These guys were preserving their past. They were more concerned with with all the old. They weren't looking for the Messiah, so they missed him when he came. And so they called this guy and they said, hey, how is it that you were blind and now you see? And this is the man's response. He simply says, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went. Underlined, the man called Jesus. This is all he knew about this guy. This is all he knew. It was a man called Jesus. They told me his name was Jesus. And he said, go wash. So I went. I love the obedience. I love the obedience in this man. For for many years in in ministry, I've wrestled with the fact that so many times as believers, we are well-educated beyond our level of obedience in Christ. Stuff I still wrestle with, stuff I think we all still wrestle with. We grow in knowledge, but to apply that and begin to live it out is very different. But so I love the fact that this man, all he knew about is that his name was Jesus. He told me to go and I went. That was it. He was, he was conflicted. But then that led him to a curious state. Because verse 17, when the Pharisees began to question him, He now refers to Jesus as a prophet. Verse 17, so they said again to him, to the blind man, what do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? He said, he is a prophet. So so now he went from, well, his name is Jesus. I know that much. He told me to go and I went. Man, I think he's a prophet. I, I think he's a prophet. Verses 31 to 33, he's being grilled by, again, the Pharisees. And he concluded Jesus to be a man of God. So now he's progressed from just knowing that he's Jesus to, oh, I think he's a prophet. Now he's saying, I I believe he's a man of God. He's still curious, but something unique or real is beginning to take place in his heart and life. Verse 31, we know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. So now he's thinking, well, this guy must be a worshiper of God and, and, and do his will because God listened to him and he healed me. Verse 32, never since the world began has it, has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Do you see the progression in this blind man's growth? The, the more he's pressing into the righteousness and the light of Jesus, he's growing in, in his faith. He's growing in his understanding. Then he progresses to his final statement that I believe is his complete confession of faith. Uh, In verse 35, we pick up in John chapter 9, Jesus heard, this is now the Pharisees had re-entered the dialogue here a little bit, and Jesus heard that they had cast him out and having found him, right? So now this guy's been cast away again, and so Jesus goes and he finds him. He says, do you believe in the Son of Man? This is a messianic title that Jesus uses for himself. And in verse 36, the man answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Now think about this for a moment. This guy has never seen Jesus' face until this moment. Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. Get this. He said, Lord, I believe. He became committed in that moment. There was something real that Jesus conveyed to him, not just the physical healing, the grace, the love, the restoration that he never got from the Pharisees who'd cast him out. Where did Jesus go? He invaded the darkness and he went and found this man again. And he invaded his life speaking to him. And and the man's Lord, I believe, I I think was the turning point of his life. So so we see that that light invades darkness, light attracts things, uh, light causes growth, but I also want you to see that light is blinding. Light is blinding. Maybe it's just me getting older uh, but all these new headlights and stuff are like really bright to me. 
And if I flash you going down the road because I think your brights are on because it's just bright, it's just me, sorry about that. Um, but you know, man, brightness coming at you, confronting you right in front of you is blinding. So here it is because verses 39 to 41 show us that the same light that leads this man, this person to salvation in Jesus Christ blinds others. Years ago, a friend of mine always said, the same sun that melts the ice hardens the clay. And I'm thinking that's exactly what took place here. The same light of of the, the world in the person of Jesus Christ melted this man's heart with grace and love and truth and drew him to himself while at the other side of it over here, it blinded others. John chapter 9 in verse 40, some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, are we also blind? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. In other words, you are responsible for what you know. If you were blinded to the truth and now the truth has been revealed to you, you are now responsible for what you know. It's like a speed limit going down Strickland or on 540. It doesn't say 100. I think it says 95, if, I, if I'm correct. Um, but you're responsible, right? Now, now I've been confronted with the truth. Now I'm responsible for what I know. And Jesus is saying to these guys, look, I mean, you know, your guilt remains. You see, but your guilt remains because you are blinded to the truth. Now, this isn't the first time that Jesus refers to the Pharisees, these hypocritical religious leaders, as blind. Uh, I love the story in Matthew chapter 15. Let me just read this for you. Then the disciples came and said to him, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? I love that. (laughs) Of course he knew, right? I mean, every time Jesus did something incredible, somebody got mad. And it was typically the Pharisees. It was the religious people. Because Jesus is ministering, he's caring, he's healing, he's doing things. So the disciples are like, hey, Jesus, did you know that the Pharisees were offended? To which Jesus says, verse 13, he answered, every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. Wow, interesting words from Jesus, right? There are religious things going on that do not belong to my Father. But that's not your responsibility. Let the Father uproot them. Anything the Father has not planted will be uprooted. The blind are leading the blind. You you can't do that. Only the Holy Spirit and the the light of Jesus Christ can draw people to himself. He says, "Just, just leave them alone. The Pharisees had admitted that they could see, and therefore they were now guilty because they rejected the evidence that they saw in the person of Jesus Christ because the gospel brings about different reactions from different kinds of hearts. Maybe you've been confronted with the truth of God's word at one stage of life and and you weren't ready to receive and you get confronted with the same thing again and and now you're ready. Or maybe you've been confronted with the truth of, of God's love and grace and at one point you were ready but the circumstances of life had made you hard. Maybe you've rebelled, maybe you're turning away. God's going to meet us all at all those various points. But the second main point that I want to share as we start to wrap up is simply that not only that Jesus is the light of the world, but I think what we see in this text is that the light of the world changes us. The light of the world changes us. As you move into this Christmas week, you need to realize that if you have received Christ, you are a changed person. I love the story of this man because Jesus steps into the darkness, he saves, he heals, he restores sight to this man who was blind. That's what Jesus does for us. He steps into our life and our brokenness, he takes away our guilt, he forgives, and he gives us a story. What's your story? See, because of Jesus, we now begin to step into dark places. And in doing so, we should have a story to tell just like this man. This guy has been kicked out of the temple. He's been alienated from the Pharisees and from God's people. We see it when we pick up in in chapter 9 from 18 down to about 23. We just see that alienation taking place. And to the point that they call his parents. 
These Pharisees are so conflicted with, with this man's story, they call his parents in and say, hey, is this your son? He was born blind. How is it that he can see? The text actually tells us they were so afraid of being ousted from the temple that they didn't want to answer. So they said, well, um, he's of age, ask him. <laughs> Folks, that's religion. That's man-made, that's created. That Jesus said, if my father didn't plan it, it's gonna be uprooted, it's no good. But it's interesting because this becomes this guy's mission field. When we look at the passage, I find it absolutely interesting that the parents were afraid of being put out. It literally says to be put out of the synagogue. So here's this man, blind from birth, healed by Jesus, and we have no idea how much time in the day has taken place. An hour, two hours, five hours, six hours. He's, the Pharisees had pulled him in twice. Jesus went and sought him out. He went to the pool. It had to be a pretty busy day so far. But yet within that same day, I love what it says because with absolutely no theological training, this man has never been to a Bible study. He's not been baptized. He's not taken communion. He's not been on a mission trip. He's not been through any training classes. And yet he is now confronting probably one of the most difficult, most toughest audiences of skeptics possible and simply tells them what Jesus has done for him. He didn't go in with an outline. He didn't go in with any memorized thing. But I look at this text and I go, this is the reason many of us are afraid to share our faith. Because we're afraid we're going to get confronted by these kind of guys who know more than we do. And they're going to begin to ask us hard questions. And I'm not going to know how to answer those questions. So I'm simply not going to say anything. Listen, Jesus changes us. The light of the world changes us. And we should have a story to tell. So with no theological training, no equipping whatsoever, this blind man, pick it up with me in verse 24 of John chapter 9. So for the second time now, they, that's the Pharisees, called the man who had been blind and said to him. So for the second time now, they're wrestling with this. These guys are conflicted. They're religious. It's all about their rules. It's all about their activities. They've missed the point of Jesus' love and grace. They missed the fact that Jesus was the light of the world. They are blinded. This man steps in, and for the second time, they're confronting him hey, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. And he answered, that's the blind man. Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know that though I was blind, now I see. Amidst the skeptics, amidst probably one of the hardest things that you and I are, would be afraid of, he simply says, look, I don't know. I don't have a great answer for you. That's one of the best things you can do with somebody if you're, if you're just talking about the grace and love of Jesus. They're going to confront you potentially with questions. It's okay to say, I don't know. But here's what I do know. As, as you walk in relationship with Jesus, what is he doing in your life? Is he building a story in you? What can you tell them? This is what I do know. There's a lot of things I don't know. But here's what I do know. And so, so he says to them, because it goes on, verse 26, they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? Verse 27 is priceless. He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen, right? So this is the blindedness. I've told you about the light. You've been blinded. You refuse to listen. But I love what he says. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Bam! What, what do you want me to tell you? I was born blind. At this point, he could literally go, look, man, honestly, I've never seen the guy. Some of you will get it after lunch. At this point, I've never seen the guy. If he walked in the room, I wouldn't know him. If, if he came in right now, I wouldn't know. I might recognize his voice, but I was, it was such a broken thing and such a crowd. All I know is this some guy put mud on my eyes, told me to go wash. I can see. I don't know what else to tell you. There's no theological basis for that. I can't tell you anything I learned in Bible study. I can't tell you anything I learned from a, a mentor, a discipler. I, I, I don't know. All I can tell you is this. Why do you want me to tell you the same thing again? Hey, are you guys interested in being his disciples too? What a great comeback. He had a story to tell. He didn't have all the answers, but he had a story. 
Do you have a story? When you think about celebrating Christmas this week, the fact that Jesus is the light of the world, do you have a story? As you encounter, as you invade darkness and, and attract things to the light and the glory of Jesus, do you have a story? Pastor Scott last week, one of his last points was simply this phrase, listen, God's light is dispersed through people whose hope is in Him. And he read from Matthew chapter 5, I want to close with this verse. Because Jesus, speaking to His followers, now listen, Jesus has just said multiple times, I am the light of the world, I am the light of the world, I am the light of the world. Look what He says in Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 14, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. You are the light of the world. He's speaking to those who are committed, those who've placed their trust in him, those who are saying, you are the Lord, you are the Savior, you are the light of the world. I place my trust in you. And we step into the brokenness and the darkness and we simply invite people to go with us. Hey, do you want to be his disciple too? I don't have all the answers, but let me tell you what he's done for me. Let me tell you what he's doing in my life. Let me tell you about my cruddy brokenness right now, but how God is restoring me, how he's giving me peace. God, the eternal light that we discover in John chapter 1, who always existed, came to be Emmanuel. He is God with us in the person of Jesus Christ, born in Bethlehem, laid in a manger. This Emmanuel is still with us in the gift of his Holy Spirit, the one that Jesus promised. He said, I will not leave you alone. I will send you another one, the comforter, the counselor, the Holy Spirit, who will be with you and continue to teach you. That gift is given to us. Have you received that gift? If so, I just want to invite you to be a city set on a hill, to be the light. Jesus said, you are, as my follower, as you've trusted me, as you celebrate me as the light of the world, you are the light of the world. I want to invite us this week to boldly step into dark places, invade the darkness with the light of Jesus. You willing to do that? Let's pray together. Father, you are the light of the world. You've extended that love and grace to us. Your word says that even while we were st still sinners, you died for us. Father, we thank you for the hope of Jesus, the light of the world, that you've entrusted to us this incredible privilege and responsibility to be the light of the world to a broken, broken, dark place. Lord, fill us with the light of, of the Spirit of God, Send us from this place, Lord, prepared to step into darkness and, and convey your love and your light as we simply share our story in our brokenness, in our mistakes. God, that you are still doing redeeming work in us. For that, we give you praise. It's in your name we pray together. Amen. Thank you for joining our sermons online. We hope to see you in person soon. Our location and service times can be found at our website, sfchurch.com. If God has stirred your heart today and you'd like someone to pray with, or if you'd like more information about Jesus, please take a moment and email us at info at sfchurch.com. Thank you again. God bless.